abandoned, alone, and at risk. Animals are living in limbo, and there is uncertainty that they will find their forever homes. Shelters all across the country are at capacity, forcing advocates to come up with some creative ways to save lives. Stephen Cavazos tells us about a solution that takes us on board a humanitarian flight. All right, let's talk pets, because some say these numbers are pretty concerning for the city of San Antonio and around the country. We are seeing about 900,000 pets that are euthanized each and every year. So while some say the problem may be in the streets, some say the solution is in the sky. Instead of just flying around in a circle, I could actually get in the plane, go meet some people I never would meet, see places I never would have seen and help all involved. My name is Brian Tamstra and I'm uh, a volunteer pilot with Pilots and Paws. Hamster has had a long-standing love for aviation and animals, and he just completed his first flight for the organization. Hey, how are y'all? Hi. It was a great experience. You know, you, you kind of get hooked up with a uh, dog in need through a message board and work through them and to coordinate the pickup, the drop off to a foster family. And it was really interesting because the lady who was doing most of the coordinating was from Wisconsin. So I thought that was kind of unique that she found a dog in Groveton, Texas, which is a tiny town in East Texas and found a foster family for them in Georgetown, Texas. Here's how it works. Volunteers associated with animal rescues communicate with volunteer pilots through an online message board. A volunteer associated with a rescue just needs to request a transport and then fill out information on the animal, along with the city and states of the pickup and drop off. Most volunteer pilots can fly 250 miles. Beyond that, other pilots can help with different legs of a transport. It makes, you know, a more reachable experience uh, when you have a pilot that can fly a couple hours instead of trying to find somebody, two or three people to drive six or eight hours. So it definitely broadens the horizons, I guess, in terms of animal rescue. Jason Chipkin is from California. He has been with Pilots and Paws since 2008 and has flown between 40 to 50 rescues. He calls the feeling rewarding. Fast and efficient is the name of the game. The, the flight itself, the dog's a little nervous and everything like that, but then when you get to the other end, the adopting family is so excited and it's kind of like a weight off your shoulders, like, okay, there's, there's one more saved. Well, let's head back and start getting the next one ready. Joe Brendel lives in Wisconsin and is associated with several animal rescues across the country. She coordinates about three to four flights a week. Most recently, she arranged for Hamster to fly this little guy out. However, she points to a specific problem, and that's a lack of spay and neuter. So we need laws that are made and enforced, and they needs to be spay and neuter laws down there. It has to stop. That's the key to everything. Brendel says when shelters become overcrowded, animals are at risk for being euthanized. That's why she calls pilots and paws life-saving. If this puppy didn't leave the shelter, he was going to be killed. He was left on the side of the road by somebody, and he was lucky he wasn't killed. And um, the animal control officer picked him up. And uh, Sharon with the shelter reached out to a rescue, and then to me, and then I reached out to pilots. Within an hour, Hamster arrived to his destination, and this puppy arrived to his new start in life. Hamster believes Pilots and Paws is just one way to turn a passion into a purpose. The, the people dropping the dog off, they were very appreciative because it's a passion of theirs. And then the people we dropped it off to, um, I really, it, the dog kind of is what brought everybody together. I think that, the, you know, what I take away from it as is there's always a way to help. So we want to hear from you. Scan this QR code and tell us what issues you want us to address or what creative solutions that you have come up with. Don't forget to subscribe, to hit subscribe on YouTube, and as well, like us on Facebook. After the break, more than 300 athletes with physical disabilities competing in the Texas Regional Games. Happening right here in San Antonio, find out what it means to these athletes competing next. Hundreds of military, adult, and youth athletes with physical disabilities competing in San Antonio at the 2023 Texas Regional Games. Our Tiffany Huerta shows us how this competition is empowering athletes and connecting them with opportunities. 
Hundreds of athletes from across Texas and the country are here in San Antonio for this incredible event. They're going to be participating in everything from track and field, tennis, and archery. Today is about sports for athletes with physical disabilities. We have 10 different sports that we do over three days. The 12th annual Texas Regional Games kicked off at the Star Soccer Complex next to Morgan's Wonderland Friday morning. It is more than just a competition. It's also a, a means of rehabilitation for them as well. The Texas Regional Games are in partnership with the Hartford Texas Regional Parasport and San Antonio Sports. Event director Wendy Gumbert says more than 300 athletes are participating this year. And we have a special um, group that's been training for a week before this. They're training also for the War Games Challenge, but it's the Air Force team and they are here. Um, uh, 70 athletes have come from all over the United States to represent the Air Force and to train for their next competitions. Gumbert says through competition, athletes gain confidence, self-esteem and independence. There are so many adapted sports programs in San Antonio, but also for our military athletes. And we're over 50% uh, wounded service members that come to this event. And uh, we all know we're, we're military city USA, so it's great to have it here. Carlos Quintanilla from Tampa, Florida is competing in powerlifting. It gives me a, a sense of outlet that I can see all these people and see the, the, the adaptive sports community and just conversate with them, make new friends, is these make family, you know, uh, uh, create new connections. Quintanilla has a message for anyone thinking of participating in the future. Your mind is, only, is, your, is your only limitation. You, you put your mind to anything, you could do anything. Nothing's impossible. Tiffany Huertas, KSET 12 News. U.S. government adjusting the way it tracks COVID-19. The nation's coronavirus public health emergency ends next week on May 11th. That's when, for the first time in three years, the agency will stop posting a national count of COVID-19 cases. The color-coded maps of county-level transmission and disease, that will go away. Other changes include the CDC no longer tracking variants down to the state level. Instead, the agency plans to track the burden and spread of disease primarily through hospitalizations and deaths. Yet another change, Dr. Rochelle Walensky is stepping down as the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In a letter to President Biden, Dr. Walensky said the end of the COVID-19 public health emergency would also be the end of her tenure at the CDC. During her two plus years leading the agency, Dr. Walensky not only led the efforts to control the pandemic, but also monkeypox, Ebola in Uganda, and other infectious diseases. Dr. Walensky will leave at the end of June. An alarming new report out this week highlighting a growing concern among educators in the United States. Test scores reveal a sharp decline for many U.S. students in history and civics. Mike Valerio has more on what's behind this new trend and what experts say needs to be done about it. For parents and teachers across the United States, the revelations are troubling, but perhaps not surprising. The declines that we're seeing, particularly in U.S. history, were widespread for lower, middle, and higher performing students. A report from the National Center for Education Statistics, often referred to as the nation's report card, shows a sharp drop in test scores for eighth graders in U.S. history and civics across several themes, including democracy, culture, technology, and the changing role of America in the world. 40% of students scored below basic proficiency in 2022. That's an increase of 6% since 2018. And only 22% of students tested were found to be proficient or advanced in civics. Ebony Walton, a statistician with the organization that conducted the study, says the results highlight a continuing pattern of lower test scores across several subjects, including math and reading. On the whole, we are seeing, particularly for our lower performing students, declines almost across the board, regardless of subject. Experts point to the disruption from the COVID-19 pandemic as a major reason behind the recent struggles for American students. But when it comes to history and civics, Walton sees a problem that's existed for years. We see no change uh, almost in 30 years on average uh, or across are what we call our percentiles for lower, middle, and higher performing students in either of these subjects, meaning that in almost 30 years, we're not tracking much progress in these areas. I'm Mike Valerio reporting. Look outside with live cam this evening. It's a warm one, but hello, humidity. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And that humidity is with us tomorrow. It's with us on Sunday, even into the beginning of next week, which means 
It is going to feel very hot out there. A summer like weekend is expected. Highs in the low 90s for a good portion of the area. And yes, higher dew points making it feel even warmer for those weekend plans. Also a few stray storm chances still in the forecast really as early as this evening. So we'll get you a look at all of those details after the break. An investigation underway after dozens of migrants were found inside a train car in Kinney County. The sheriff there tells us that more than 80 were overheated and dehydrated. Another 60 people ran into a brush area. Right now, no deaths have been reported. An hour long standoff ends with a man in custody. BCSO says Gerardo Mendiola shot at two constables who were serving him an eviction notice at an RV park. Mendiola then barricaded himself in an RV. Bear County Sheriff's Office says he did surrender peacefully. SAPD keeping a close eye on San Antonio's school districts. This comes after posts on social media threatened violence against two schools. SAPD says those threats are not credible. Classes resumed normally today. We're less than one day away from polls opening for the municipal elections. City Council races, school bonds, propositions like Prop A. Filling up the ballot for tomorrow's local elections. We have full election coverage right now on KSAT.com. And that's your 60 second recap. Hopefully weekend plans include voting. If you haven't done that already, whatever you're getting out to do, it's going to be a little sticky. Out yeah, there. maybe bring a water bottle with you. <laughs> I you're think be that's outside. probably a good bet. Yeah, heat safety. We haven't really had to talk about that a lot. April was very nice. Temperatures held at bay for the most part. And of course, we had above average rainfall, which was fantastic. But yes, this weekend, it might be the first weekend of May, but it is feeling a lot more like summer. And the reason being is because of the oppressive humidity that has returned. Look at the dew points, how we measure that moisture here in the atmosphere sphere in the upper 60s and low 70s in and around the San Antonio area. So that's very much in the oppressive category. You can feel it the second you step outside. And that's also why heat indices, what it feels like outside, are even higher than the actual air temperatures. Air temperatures are above average by about 10 degrees in spots here this hour. We're in the low 90s officially out there on the thermometers here in Bear County. It's 90 in Bulverde, 86 in Canyon Lake, 97 in Hondo, 95 right now in Bandera. But these yellow numbers are those feels like temperatures well into the upper 90s and low triple digits. And that's just because, yes, it is muggy out there. And that's going to be the theme tomorrow and into Sunday, into next week as well. And along with that, we also need to monitor a couple of isolated storm chances. Nothing widespread and high coverage each day over the next several days but at least the potential is there to find a stray storm each afternoon. We're still under that southwest flow. You can see just to the north of us some severe thunderstorms approaching the I-35 corridor. Here locally, most of us are dry, and I do expect that theme to continue this evening. But you'll notice west of I-35, we're starting to see a couple of downpours develop. This one in northern Medina County, south of Tarpley west of Medina Lake in the Lake Hills area, but that is moving farther up to the northeast. So we'll see how well that can hold together and if we can find some further development with that little downpour. And then a second one that's farther off to the south. It actually is approaching the I-35 corridor out there in LaSalle County near Millet, as well as Gardendale. A little shower approaching the I-35 corridor. So we'll keep eyes on that. Into Saturday and Sunday, 20% potential for an isolated storm or two still possible. If a storm does develop, it could potentially become strong to severe. But the bigger theme for pretty much everybody is going to be the heat and it's going to be the humidity. Waking up to the muggy low 70s each morning, some patchy fog possible as well, and then daytime highs climbing into the upper 80s and low 90s. But yes, feels like temperatures still in the upper 90s and triple digits. Very similar to what we're seeing out there right now. So here's a look at your Saturday morning. 
morning, low 70s expected, 71 to 72 here in Bear County, 72 in Divine, 70 up in Bandera, 71 in Comfort. Yes, some areas of patchy fog, morning cloud cover expected, very similar to what we saw today as well. And then into the early afternoon, still mostly cloudy skies, 83 by lunchtime, 90 into the 3 p.m. hour, and then daytime highs climbing into the low 90s here in San Antonio, some upper 90s certainly possible the farther south and west that you go. 92 here in town, 91 in Bernie, 98 possible over in Uvalde. And yes, the moisture continues over the next several days. So we're very much in that copy and paste kind of pattern. And you can see, yes, that we do have that 20% potential for a few isolated storms each and every afternoon. And then as we head into the later portions of next week, coverage could be slightly higher as our weather pattern starts to change. But yes, overall theme this weekend, heat safety, stay hydrated because it is going to be so hot <laughs> across the area. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mia. We'll be right back with your buzz. In the buzz today, a historian believes that he has solved a mystery surrounding one of the best known artworks in the world. This one. Silvato Vincetti says that he has identified the location painted behind Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. He says the bridge pictured in that famous painting is the Romito Bridge in the nearby Tuscan town of La Torina. Yeah, the historian made a virtual reconstruction of the bridge to show the similarities between it and the painting and pointed to a stretch of territory that he says corresponds to what da Vinci portrayed in the artwork's landscape. Vicente said he drew on documents from the state archives in Florence for his research and found Leonardo da Vinci actually lived near the area between 1501 and 1503. All right, the Indianapolis Zoo wants to help a threatened species and it's putting its money where its mouth Ooh. is with a challenge. It's offering $1 million grants to a group that can develop and carry out a plan that will have a measurable and sustainable impact on the future of a species. It's inviting field conservationists from around the world to apply. The species they pick must be considered critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, or extinct in the wild. Pre-applications are due June 4th and a full application due December 3rd. A panel of international animal conservation experts will choose a winner and announce them in February. One million dollars. Yes. Google is giving the world a sneak peek at its first foldable smartphone. The tech giant teased the Pixel Fold in a video posted to Twitter and YouTube. The phone has a vertical hinge that, when opened, reveals a tablet-like display. Yeah, seems to be all the rage. Google has not shared the Pixel Fold specs yet, but it could provide more details when it hosts its annual developer conference next week. The company is expected to unveil a new Pixel budget phone during the event, as well as its latest Android operating system and advancements to its AI-powered Bard chatbot. What happens when you drop these foldable phones? Asking for someone who does that a lot. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe not for me. Maybe you should just <laughs> fold on the idea. Okay, we'll, we'll be right be back. Right back. All right, we'll continue to monitor that little downpour in northern Medina County, just west of Medina Lake right now, to see if it can further develop or hold together as it tracks northeast, potentially skirting the far northwestern portions of Bear County within the next hour or so. Again, we'll keep eyes on it. Other than that, it is hot, it is humid. That is not going to change this weekend. And yes, daily stray storm chances continue. So a lot to monitor over the next several days, guys. All right, thank you, Mia, and thank you for watching the news at six. See you on the night beat at 10.